Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Welcome to another exciting adventure, an episode of Authors on the Air. This is Ann White, and I'm with my sassy co-host, Pam Stack, and we are ready to bring you another guest. This one is going to probably stop your breathing and give you the shivers, but we're going to brave on. Um, Pam, welcome, everybody, before I let them know where they can find us. Hello there. How are you today, Ann, the smart one? And I'm thrilled to be with you today. Thrilled being our operative word, I guess, right? Oh, yeah, thrilled will be the word today. There might be another one called Scared, yeah. Um, Before, again, we're going to hold you in suspense. If you would like to find more about Authors on the Air, first of all, on the computer when you're listening to Blog Talk Radio, there's a little thumbprint, and it says Follow. We would love if you would just click that thumbprint. That lets Blog Talk Radio know that you enjoy this program. You can find us at facebook.com forward slash authors on the air. And please friend us there. We like to give away free books. It's a lot of fun. And you get to interact with uh, the authors that we have as our guests. And lastly, we have a web page, again, www.authorsontheair.com. And there you can find blogs. So you're able to purchase the books that we blog about. We do reviews. So if you are a reader, it's a good place to check out and see what Smart and Sassy had to say about the author or the book. And without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Pam to bring on our guest for today. Well, thank you, Anne. I'm thrilled to uh, say that we have a wonderful writer, author, and actor with us today. He also is an editor. Um, please welcome Keelan Patrick Burke, who is with us today. Hello, Keelan. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing great today. How are you guys doing? Welcome to Authors on the Air. Thank you. So let's jump right into it. You write kind of really thriller, chiller, horror, and uh, murder and mayhem and mystery. How would you describe your work? That's how I describe it. (laughs) That's an accurate description, I think, of of a lot of it. But um, I think I've only just recently moved into kind of more thriller territory. The books I'm better known for tend to be in the paranormal genre, ghost stories, and uh, they actually tend to be fairly subtle. Now, the newest release, the one that kind of crosses the line into the more thriller territory, is definitely not subtle, but because of the subject matter, it kind of it kind of had to be that way. It's um, Ken is kind of a study of people and the psychology of violence and revenge, really, so you can't really approach something like that. Well, I'm sure you could. Better writers than me probably could, but I kind of needed to get my hands dirty with it. And, you know, and, and, and I, I was just... You did. Yeah. Oh, I know. I was just looking at one of the reviews, and by the way, listeners, for Ken, which is the one that is just recently out, he has 23 reviews, and they're all five and four star, 21 five star, and that's pretty amazing for a brand new book. But one of the reviews described it, Ken has been described as the Chainsaw Massacre meets Deliverance. Keelan, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think it actually, I get that a lot, and I think basically what it does is it takes movies like that, and, and the problem I've always had with movies like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Deliverance and things like that, they're great movies, but anything that's come after tends to neglect character development in favor of just outright violence, so what I wanted to do was to kind of give the characters both the heroes and the villains real personalities and real motivations so that it it would come across as more believable and you know, and basically why these people are doing this. I have no interest in writing a story about axe wielding maniacs chasing big breasted bimbos through a woods. It just doesn't do it for me. No, I so don't know. I that to... sounds okay. It sounds hard to me. But what but, I want you to know, do Keelan... is just basically explain why these things, you know, if they happened, why they happen and who the people are that are doing things, you know, who are suffering that and who the people are who are doing it. Right, and what I would like, would you give us a thumbnail of how you describe Kin to somebody? If you were in the elevator and they said, what's your latest book about? How would you describe Kin? Revenge. Oh, well, that's it. a thumbnail. Would, it is. That, it's a very small, a very it's small Tom, thumbnail. It's a Tom, Tom thumbnail, yeah. Uh-huh. I, would, uh, I would just say, basically, it's about survivors of an 
atrocity who are plagued with guilt for being survivors when their friends died mm-hmm. and they decide that the only way to reconcile it and to move on with their lives is to make sure that the people who did, did this to them can never do it again. Wow. Wow. Um, now, this is a standalone book, correct, Keelan? That's correct, yeah. Okay. You, um, because you have a very, very popular series of books called the Timmy Quinn stories, so this is not related to that. No, not at all. Okay. Completely different genre. Okay. Uh, um, mm. okay, very good. Now, uh, Keelan, this is um, a tree book and an, e- and an e-book, is it? It's a what? Uh, is this a pa- is is your book is your book in paperback as well as oh, on, it is. Um, any book? It is. Yeah, it was originally re- released as a signed limited edition hardcover from uh, from Seventy Nine's Publications. That sold out about a year ago. So since then, I've released it digitally and just recently in paperback as well. Congratulations! How are sales going? Very good, actually. I'm I'm quite delighted with the sales particularly uh, digitally it seems to have really taken off and obviously good word of mouth helps but the you know I'm immensely gratified by the reception it's getting where do you get your story ideas Keelan oh the nightmare question I have no idea <clears throat> I think anything really I mean the example I give is uh, I was I was just out walking one uh, one evening in the fall and there was a guy across the street who was walking the other way and he had a hat pulled down over his face and he was wearing this coat that was about two sizes too big for him. And I thought it looked really strange. And there was leaves blowing all around the place. I said hello, he didn't answer. And as I walked on, I started thinking about somebody who looked like that who was on his way into town to do something. What? And, you know, when you generate questions like that for yourself, you get kind of assaulted by possibilities and ideas. Basically, what you do is just find the one that's most effective and one that you're not used to seeing elsewhere, and you try and find an original take on it. I I think I read somewhere that you said that you always have a story going in your mind. You've always got a story in there someplace, that you're constantly creating these stories. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the kind of thing that that keeps me from sleeping some nights because there's uh, half a dozen ideas, at least, bouncing around there, developing themselves, so... And what Which do you do when they're when they're in your head and you can't sit? Do you get up and write? Sometimes, if it's you know, if there's been times where I've gone to gone to bed and either in dreams or just in drifting off to sleep, I will just get hit with an, a complete novel idea from start to finish, and then I'll get up and write it. Wow, that's amazing. Do you set aside time every day to write, Keelan? Are you? Um, hard and fast with your writing time or do you let it flow whenever you organically feel that happening? Um, it's a bit of both. I try to write every single day regardless of whether the inspiration is there or not because I think it's good practice even if what you write you ultimately don't end up using. It's good exercise just to sit down and force yourself to write. Uh, but generally I will write probably five or six hours a day if I'm in the middle of a novel and I'm, you know, if the the inspiration's coming hard and fast. I'll, I'll probably put in 12 hours. Wow. Sometimes wow. more That's than that. That's a lot of writing. That's a lot of writing. That's that, you know, we talk to a lot of different authors, and very rarely do we hear someone who tells us that they write for 12 hours. Um, it, is it exhausting to write, especially in this genre? It is. Um, well, I mean, I think in any genre it's exhausting to write, depending on how much work you put in. I mean, basically you're, you're in your own world and you're, you're feeding the story from that, and you you find it exhilarating when you're doing it, but once you stop for the day, it's like you've been working on a construction site all day, building a house, which is essentially what it is, and you're just completely drained, you know? Wow. Do you share your work with your family? Do you have a a family? Yeah. So do you read some of the horror parts to them? What does your family think? No, I don't read it to them. Um, My girlfriend (coughs) is a big fan of this genre, and many genres so she reads she reads everything I write and she loves this obviously she has to or we probably wouldn't be together and uh, <laughs> yeah my family my mother in particular is uh, is a big reader of my stuff she's kind of the reason I got started in the first place so she's a big horror reader as well and everything I write I send it over to her and 
she'll tell me the God's honest truth about it. She'll say, yeah, this one was fantastic. I loved it. Or, yeah, this one wasn't your best one. Next time that you write something like this, try and leave out all the disgusting parts. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of difficult if you write in horror or that deep thriller type of dark stuff, you know. It um, is, but I try not to focus too much on gore. I'm not a, a huge fan of gore. I think unless it, it's necessary for the story, it's the only time I'll use it, otherwise I won't. Uh, uh, speaking of your mom and your girlfriend, you you are originally from Ireland, I understand. And I am. I think I've read about how it is that you came to be living in the States. Would you mind relating a little bit without giving too much of yourself away? Um, <clears throat> let me see. Uh, how to approach this tactfully? Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was living in Ireland. I was working in a, a bar paying off college debt, and an American tourist came in one night. The bar was dead. She was with somebody there, uh, just a friend of hers who she used to travel with. At least that's what the story was. And um, he was hungover, so she was there on her own. And we talked all night long, basically, because it was, you know, there was nothing else we needed to do. She left and gave me her address, said, keep in touch, I give her mine. And I thought that was the end of it, you know, when you're working the bar particularly in Ireland, you're used to people coming and going and saying, oh, let's keep in touch, and they don't. So three months later for my birthday, I got plane tickets in the mail. Hmm. And it was basically to come over here for three months, just as a kind of an extended vacation. And that was in 2001, about three weeks before 9-11. And uh, I'm still here. Wow. Well, congratulations. That's a great story. That's a fabulous story. So Imagine from what you like I told you the whole story. Ooh. <laughs> well, I said only the parts you're willing to, to tell us. <laughs> and yeah, here's we have a question for Keelan. <laughs> I do. Keelan, at what point in your life were you comfortable calling yourself an author? Um, have you always been an author as you look at your past life, or at what point did you make that transition? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I've always been a writer. I've been writing since... I could write, you know. I mean, I, I have short stories written when I was eight years old, and I always knew this was what I wanted to do. But I think when it when I published, when my stuff started to get published in serious venues, in professional venues where I had kind of aspired to crack those markets, I think that's when I, I called myself a professional writer. Um, mm-hmm. Author, I don't know. When I think author, whether it's right or wrong, I think somebody who's written novels. And so probably when I published my first novel or had it published, I think then I'd have been comfortable calling myself that without trying to stumble over an explanation. <laughs> wow. You have a very extensive body of work. Um, actually, when we were researching you, I, I noticed Wikipedia has quite a long page on you. And you have an incredible body of work very long, a lot of um, short stories and so on. Is that how you started, Keelan? Yeah, I think it's um, obviously not for everybody, but I think it's a common progression for writers to test the waters and their own abilities with shorter work. I know for for a fact that I couldn't write novels uh, um, when I first started. I just didn't know the technique. I didn't know. It's not just a case of sitting down and, well, if you can write a short story, you can write a novel. They're two different, completely different animals. And I wrote a lot of short stories before I saw the work starting to get longer. It became novellas. And when it came time to write a novel, I actually had to force it. I started an online serial where people signed up and every week they would read a chapter. So I'd have to write a chapter every week. And I had a thousand or so people reading it, so I knew that if I just chickened out like I had done with myself in the past when it came to novels, if I just said, ah, I can't do this, it's too hard, or I don't know what to do, I'd be letting down a thousand people who were really into the story. So it actually forced me to write my first book, and that was Master of the Moors, which is a kind of a, a gothic, um, Victorian-type horror story. But... It's gotten great feedback. <clears throat> it did back then. I've edited obviously a lot since then. But that's how I, I had to force myself to do it. And once I managed to write a full-length novel, I won't say I found it easy, but I was able to do it. So I've done it quite a few times since then, obviously. 
That was a good way to give yourself pressure is, um, you know, letting, doing it so publicly Mm -hmm. that you almost couldn't. I hadn't heard people do that before, but it's a wonderful way to keep yourself going. It it certainly is. And and build an audience as well. Yes, exactly. It worked. It it had many benefits. I mean, you know, the only downside to it was that because people were reading it week by week, I couldn't go back and edit what I'd already written because Mm. they'd already read it. But, you know, that's a luxury that's great to have when you actually go on to write novels just for yourself first. You can go back and change all those details. But it was an incredible learning experience. I think it was a great a great thing to do for me, particularly that early in my career. So, you know, it was good. You, and you really have been recognized by with the Brown Stroker Award nominations. Um, uh, you you got a lot of good press on this. Book list raves about you. They claim that you're the one of the most original authors in contemporary horror right now. So you're you're getting a lot of really good reviews. Um, does that affect your work it, it, personally to you? Do those things matter when you're recognized by your peers as much as they're important to us who read and like to know about our authors? Yeah, I mean, it's on a personal level, it's always good for your ego when, you know, respected publications um, have nice things to say about the work you've done. I mean, like I said, and I'll go back to the analogy of writing being like building a house. If, you know, you're a construction worker, you build a house, you stand back, you look at it, you're proud of it, you're you're delighted it's out there for the world Mm -hmm. to see, you hope Mm -hmm. it makes people happy. But if somebody drives past and shouts out the window that it's a piece of crap, it stings. If they tell you it's wonderful, that's great to hear. But ultimately, it doesn't go beyond that. It can't. Because if I sit down to write something and I think, ah, everybody loves me, what I write is going to be another pile of crap. You can't write with those things in mind. You have to write to entertain. You have to write because it's a story you absolutely have to tell or you'll go insane. And if people love it, that's fantastic. If they don't, well, that's a shame. But ultimately, you know, you can only do what you do. And if you start believing your own press or giving it too much credence or relying on it, you'll go insane, and the work will so, suffer as a result. Am I to understand, look, we, we see that your reviews on your books are really, really good. Uh-huh. What happens when you get a, a not-so-good review? How does that affect Nothing. you? It doesn't really. I mean, you know, obviously I'd love to get great reviews for the rest of my life, but that's not going to happen. That's the reality of publishing. I mean, look at great expectations or the catcher in the rye. Look at any classic book up on Amazon and you'll see that it has as many negative reviews as it does positive. You can't let it bother you. What I do sometimes do is if I get a very, very detailed or, you know, a very uh, review that is very specific in pointing out what didn't work, I might actually look at it and find that I agree with it. I might say, well, I never looked at it that way, but that's a good point. And if I do, it's something I put in my writer's toolbox and bear in mind for the future. Mm. Well, you have a really healthy uh, attitude about all that. I'm not sure uh, that many writers feel the same way. Anne, I'm sorry, go ahead. What I was wondering was you are talking about how you um, progressed as an author, as a writer. Do you plot your whole story out, Keelan, or do you let your characters sort of take you on the journey, and are you surprised when you get to the ending? Oh, that's a great question. And, yeah, I um, I don't plot anything off. The, the longer the work yeah. is, I may sometimes just have to make notes on chapter, or sorry, plot points as they go on. But, really, I tend to trust the characters to tell the story, and I am frequently surprised at where it goes. I'll, I'll come into the the office and sit down and say, all right, today I know where this chapter is going. I'm going to have character A do this and character B is going to react this way. And by the time I've finished writing for the day, I might have done none of that. It could be a completely different twist in the story, and I love it. There's nothing better mm-hmm. than that. It's exhilarating. Yeah, when you can surprise yourself, it's always kind of neat. Um, yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you about your series, um, the Timmy Quinn series. Is it truly over with Nemesis? I guess it would be because he died, right? The death of Timmy <laughs> Quinn. <laughs> he does, but again, the thing to remember is that in this world of parallel dimensions and ghosts and things, death isn't exactly final in this kind uh-huh. of universe, you know. So 
But the thing is that, yeah. yeah, that series is done, but there's about to be a spin-off series featuring one of the characters that's going to take things in a completely different direction, so... Which oh, I wonderful. might not have entertained. Yeah, I might not have entertained that, except for the sheer amount of email and, you know, that I've gotten from people and I've seen online a lot of people decrying the fact that it's going to end, that they would love for for it to continue. So Can while you that give story us a clue? Is, um, can you give us a no. clue where it's going to go? No. No. Okay. no. I thought no. I was going to tell you. <laughs> That's what you get for asking, smarty pants. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you an exclusive once the next book is written, but I won't just now because what's going to happen is at the end of Nemesis, there's going to be a fairly big excerpt from the next book. So I'm going to leave okay. it for people to be surprised. When they wow, get it. that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. And these are your uh, these books were uh, award nominated, correct, Keelan? Well, actually, you got the Boy won won the Bram Stoker Awards. Yeah, right. And the Hides was nominated, I think, the next year. But right. yeah, they've uh, they've done really well for me. Congratulations! Now, I, I have a question. You were also an actor. And I happen to, I happen to take a little peek at Slime City Massacre. Oh dear! You're tr- in the trailer on YouTube, by the way. In my opinion, uh-huh. I don't show you often enough. But <laughs> how, this is obviously not your first acting gig, is it? Um, I've done quite a bit of theater, or I did quite a bit of theater in Ireland. Um, it was. Please tell us, tell us, tell us. I gotta hear <laughs> this. And by More the way, folks. Please- Slime yes. City Massacre is a cult classic along with Slime City. You you just got to go and check it out on YouTube. Trust me, you don't want to miss this one. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, the, I had done quite a bit of theater, um, or theatrical work, but um, it was kind of through that and through some online forums where a lot of people get together to discuss um, books and the horror genre that, the director, who's also Gregory Lamberson, he's also a, a, an author and a really good one. He actually got in touch with me and said, hey, I didn't know that you had done any acting. He said, would you be interested in doing something in my next film? And, of course, I thought, yeah, you know, it's going to be some cheap thing with, uh, you know, just a, a bunch of guys running around with home movie cameras and find whatever it sounds like fun. I had no idea, really, until I showed up at the set exactly how, how big a production it was. And uh, I can honestly say it's probably one of the top five best experiences I've ever had it was it was just a riot to do it you know I don't take it too seriously I don't think anyone involved took it too seriously but they if you go into it, yeah. well if you go into watching it with the same attitude that we did going in to make it which was just absolutely to have a good time then I think the film works it, you know it was a lot of fun to make it now tell us about let's let's rewind a little bit more and go back to the theater. Uh, were you a theater major in school? Oh, no. No, I was a journalism major. Really? It's interesting. Isn't that funny? Mm-hmm. Um, I was, too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> although I don't write anything but reviews right now. Um, All right. What kind of theater did you like to do? Dramas, basically. Um, you know, things like uh, Twelve Angry Men, um, a lot of Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare stuff. I love, I love even to watch Shakespeare plays. I know, you know, not everybody does, but I'm a particular, particularly big fan of the modernization of it. I like what um, Corey Lannis and uh, Patrick Stewart doing my best. I love, I love all those updates on them. I think smart people can do some really great things with with Shakespeare's work. It doesn't always have to be so dusty and old and boring as most people seem to view it. I like, uh, I like that modernization of it. Now, which came first, the writing or the acting, Keelan? Oh, the writing. All the way. Writing came. Did you yeah. have you written for the theater? I haven't, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. I did. I wrote a children's play for. Uh, I was teaching some um, children for a couple of years in the Gwale Talked area, which means just all Gaelic language. English isn't allowed. There's about four regions in Ireland where it's just still the Gaelic language and I taught children for two years out there and I was uh, teaching theater and I wrote a play in Gaelic for the kids and we put it on and it was a big hit but that's it I haven't but I would like to uh, I would like to do more of that that's interesting and you also 
Oh, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but we were in the midst of a thunderstorm here on Miami Beach, uh, yeah. trying to avoid uh, uh, getting hit by Isaac, which doesn't look like it's going to come here. We're just feeling the well, beginnings true. of it. But um, sure. now you also edit. Yes. You have edited qu- quite a few anthologies. I mean, that's mm-hmm. incredible. Um, how did that come about? Um, basically, I am a huge fan of anthologies, and I always have been. Some of the uh, some of the biggest inspiration I've gotten outside of novels has been from short stories by other authors, and most of which I discovered through um, anthology series when I was living in Ireland. So when I came here, I didn't know whether the opportunity would exist, but I wanted to do a collection of bar stories. Now, I had just come from spending a lot of years working in a bar and spending even more of them on the wrong side of the bar, so I had heard a lot of stories, and I wanted to get all my heroes together and ask them if they'd write stories for me set in bars or pubs and taverns, and I was lucky enough that the book turned out to be an epic experience, and it was published, and it was Taverns of the Dead, so... I had a lot of fun doing that, so I wanted to do a few more. But that's basically it. I love short stories, and I love to put them, I love to gather them together, whether it's my own work or work from other writers that I admire. It's a great, and speaking uh, of writers that you admire, um, if we looked on your nightstand, what book would we find there? Well, I'll tell you. Nothing on the nightstand, but I'll, I'm looking at my bookshelves here, so that's actually an easy question to answer for once. Um, well... No surprise to anybody, Stephen King is up there. Um, Larry McMurtry. He, 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 uh, you know, it's interesting that Stephen King and Larry McMurtry seem to be considered, and I mean, as diverse as their genres are, they seem yeah. to be considered the author's authors. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think to me I, that Larry McMurtry, Lonesome Dove, is, is my all-time favorite novel. I think to be a good writer you have to read across all genres if you want to be a horror writer and all you read is horror fine you might write one or two books it might work for you but I think for your work to come across as well informed and to know the techniques and the styles and to do romance well in your own work to do mystery well you have to read across multiple genres so I mean my bookshelf while it's probably 60% horror the rest is not there's a lot of crime there there's a lot of just drama, there's a lot of non-fiction, there's an occasional romance, and I'm not talking the bodice rippers or anything like that, but there's books that would, you know, generally be classed as atonement, we'll say, is there by Ian McEwan, which is dark, but, yeah. you know, I don't like um, to limit myself. How did you get motivated to write? Who motivated you? Who inspires you? Well, as I said before, my mother was a huge inspiration. She would buy me books you know, every single week, regardless of whether we had much money or not, it was kind of a dumb thing. She'd buy food, she'd buy clothes, and there'd always be at least one book, and that was a a ritual that crossed the first ten years of my life. And uh, after that, I had a a high school English teacher who was massively inspirational. He would assign essays, stories for us to write, and every time I wrote one, he'd get me to stand at the top of the class, read it, and then answer questions on how, about my techniques. Which, you know, nowadays would probably get you beaten up by the other students, but they actually loved it. I, it was like campfire ghost story hour every time we had an English assignment. That's interesting. Do you do, when you write and you finish with a chapter, or even with several paragraphs, do you ever read out loud to yourself, Keelan, to see how, how the nuance of the sentence flows? Yeah, I will, yeah. particularly if I look at something that I think might be a little more style over substance. If I'm very impressed, if I've impressed myself with something I've written, I think, oh, my God, that sounds lovely. <laughs> I'll walk away, and I will read it, and I will think, yeah, it sounds lovely, but is it necessary? Is it a bit too much, look at me and what I can do, and not telling the story? And if that's the case, well, that's where vigilant editing comes in. You start murdering your darlings, and you say, you know what, I'll keep that phrase. Maybe when I'm writing something a little more literary or something that's completely self-indulgent and obnoxious, then I'll put it in there, (laughs) but it doesn't belong. 
in the story I'm writing. So I do, yeah, quite mm-hmm. often. Interesting. Keelan, <laughs> when you are not writing, what what's your life like? What do you like to do when you're out of your office and away from your computer? Well, reading, obviously. Um, I'm a voracious reader. Uh, other than that, which is the boring answer, I um, I love photography. I love mm-hmm. to uh, take road trips. I'm a huge traveler. I like to just sit here, finish a book, and then go, right, screw it. Let's pack some bags, get in the car, and just keep driving until we run out of gas. I love that. Mm-hmm. And through that, I've seen the majority of this country. You know, it's it's fantastic. That and do you, I do. Book do you design. have a favorite place, <clears throat> Keelan? Do you have a favorite place when you travel? Well, about two years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the girlfriend and I took a trip out west, out through uh, on Route 66, and I love it out there. I think I could probably live there. Now I say that until I bake to death within a week of moving in and get eaten by scorpions, but it looks lovely. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So Are I, you I talking like about way. like Arizona or that type? That, that, is that yeah, what you're yeah. About? Arizona, New Mexico, all out there. It, it is Wyoming as well. It all appeals to the kind of uh, the the kid in me who was a big Saturday morning Western fan. I just I love that area of the country. That is so funny. That is so funny. Um, <laughs> do you read a lot of things besides Larry McMurtry? Um, yeah, you know what I did. For a while, I went on a really massive Western phase. I was reading a lot of Ed Gorman. Um, I read Cormac McCarthy, too. He's a favorite of mine, but I don't know if you could classify him as a Western author. He's certainly done a couple of Westerns. But, yeah, basically, if anything gets brought to my attention that's a standout example of its genre, I'll hop down and read it just to see how it's done and hopefully be entertained in the process. Can you get inspiration from reading the Westerns, whether it's uh, inspiration about style? Uh, I don't know. It seems to me that voracious readers are really the best writers. Uh, We've heard that every single time we've interviewed an author, um, that you have to have a love of reading. But because you like so many different genres, Keelan, does it help you? to be a better writer? Yep, absolutely. I mean, I intentionally seek out books that I think are, are really fine examples of their genre, and I will read them, and I will always take something away from them. I might not even realize I am until I write a book two years down the road, and it has elements of character or character developments that, you know, have been informed by previous styles. Well, that's not to say, you know, ripping anybody off. It's Sometimes I'll read something. Yeah, I'll just basically in my head deconstruct somebody's style if something really, really works for me that I've read. It could be something simple like a man walking down the street and there's thunderclouds over him. I will look at it and I'll see that the guy has used three sentences to say that where it would probably have taken me ten because I'm so busy showing off. That well, are you a compact me. writer? Do you, do you, are you in favor of getting to the meat or right down to the bone versus, you know, having the gravy and all the seasonings and everything else. I, it, it seems to me you you really, you don't like to have a bunch of flowery stuff in your in your prose. So uh, when, you're, when you're looking at your own work, are you dissecting it and making sure there's not too much stuff in there? Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, I have the problem, uh, the same problem I have when I talk is that I just go on and on and on and on and on, and I need somebody there to tell me to shut up. When it comes to writing, that's usually myself. So I will notice that I've prattled on for ten pages when one would have done, and I'll cut it. I mean, people Do you have a, uh, <clears throat> a critique group? No, I am my critique group. And I also, my girlfriend and a couple of friends of mine, they'll read it. People whose opinion I trust not to stroke my ego and say, wow, you're so brilliant. My God, there's light shining out of your butt. <laughs> It's, you know, they'll tell me. They'll tell me straight up. You know what? No Full offense. Crap, you right? know I. You know I love you as a person, but this is god awful, and I want to poke my eyes out with a screwdriver. So yeah, I'll. You know, there's the people I want to read my stuff. Um, who who do you read? Who uh, do you read in the horror genre? Um. Well, uh, Charles L. Grant, Peter Straub, Bentley Little. Um, I'm reading these actually as I'm looking at it. Um, well, John Connolly is more a Twitter writer, but he has 
a lot of horror elements in his books too, a lot of supernatural elements which I quite enjoy. Yeah. Um, yeah. F. Paul Wilson, Jack Ketchum, Dan Simmons, uh, Robert McGammon. Wow, you have, so a, you have a, anybody in particular you just really, when the book comes out, you just want to grab it and run with it? King, uh, John Connolly as well. I love his Charlie Parker series, just like Crime Noir with a little bit of Supernatural. I live for those. Every yeah. time a new one comes out, I mm. buy it regardless. I don't even read the reviews. I just buy it. Michael right. Marshall Smith. <clears throat> Michael Marshall Smith or Michael Marshall, as some of his books are published. Um, I love his stuff, too. I will buy that without even reading the back of it. And I yeah, guess that's a how a lot of your fans are. You've got quite a, a big fan base. Um, were they good with you as you switched a little bit as you're coming into um, Kin as a little bit of a different um, twist? Yeah, yeah, big uh, time. And I think I think I was lucky in that, you know, it's like, and I've compared it in the past to being a sitcom star as a child, you know. You grow up in front of the public, so everything you do is monitored. I think I was the same. I think I made a couple of missteps and wrote some kind of uneven stuff. And people read it regardless, and they didn't give up on me, and they followed me into wherever, whatever territory I wanted to explore. And a good reader will trust you to do that. And a good reader will also let you know that, like a good editor, they will say to you, it's good, could you next time shut up halfway through so you're not boring my brains out the back of my head? And you listen, because you're writing. You trust you, them, you, yeah. I trust yeah. you, and it's it's no it's nothing to be taken for granted to have readers who are that that committed to reading your stuff. I can't believe it. Sometimes when I get on there and I just say, "Hey, it's finished a new short story," and you have you know hundreds of people writing, so that's fantastic. When's it coming out? I love it. It makes it easier that's for me wonderful. on the days where yeah, on the days where I walk into the office and I really really don't feel like writing. I'm depressed. I just couldn't be bothered to sit down, and then I read a bunch of emails from people raving about what they've just read of mine and that solves it then i say you know what i got to remember that today i'm not writing for me i'm writing for them that's wonderful well, Keelan, well, I think that's do you have Pam, being a i was going to ask keelan yeah. Yeah. i was going to ask keelan what advice would you give to people who come up to you and say i'd really like to be a writer i have a story in me um besides telling them to run like heck or something what what do you advise them i just don't write it but, you know, yeah. if they really have a story in them that needs to be told, then write it. Find a way to do it. Because the thing is, if you have a story that needs to be told, nothing will stop you from writing it. That's the reason that I write for a living, because if I didn't, I'd probably go on a murder spree. I absolutely just have to do it. It's so not glad you don't live in my, I'm glad you don't live in my state, Keelan. <laughs> <laughs> that was a state of confusion. Uh. <laughs> Maybe that too. Um, you, I want to go back to what you were talking about. Your fans, um, your fans are inc are just interestingly incredibly loyal. I've seen some of the pictures from your web page, and yeah. you know, you, you uh, I mean, you really have some bizarre fans. Can I tell you? But maybe that's just the nature <laughs> of the book that you write. And, but that's okay too. Um, my thought well, I is... I think they have um, to be bizarre. I mean, I'm bizarre, so you know what? If they're not bizarre, then I don't think we'd get along. But, well, it, it isn't even that. And, you know, kudos. You can... I mean, it's okay with me. You know, people think I'm strange, too, and I'm I'm okay with that. But, oh, I uh, hope you are. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> but, but, you know, I kind of like that in a friend, being a little off-center. Off but um, yeah. my my thought was that if you're if you didn't care what your fans thought, you wouldn't be published. So you think that's a motivator as well? You know, when well, I'd probably working, right? be published. I'd probably be published because at the end of the day, when you write a story, it's to the publisher that you have to sell it. They can tell you they don't like it, but they'll publish it and put it out there. The difference is you'll get a bunch of people read it and then realize that the guy who wrote the book is a complete douchebag and then they won't read any more. So while your first mm -hmm. book might do well, the rest won't. Won't. Now, uh, do you envision your style of writing, mm, the, the storytelling, the type of stories that you're telling, do you envision that changing with Ken? You, you, you're a little bit, it's a little bit different twist on the type of books that you've written before. Do you envision that you'll be changing again, maybe the genre changes up just a little bit more? Or will you always kind of stay where you are? Or are you in your comfort zone 
or have you reached that comfort zone yet? My comfort zone really is writing a good story with great characters and, you know, books that people enjoy. Obviously, it has changed from when I, I first started this, and it, I'm sure it will change again as the years go by. I mean, you get older, the, the themes that you want to explore change, your method of approach changes, because writing is a process that's, you know, always changing. Every day it changes. So, honestly, it's not a conscious choice to do that. I don't sit down and say, wow, well, that would be a really mature idea to chase and it will surprise everybody. I don't do that. I usually don't realize what I've done until the book is done and I read over it and I go, wow, this is different for me. Wow, that's interesting. Mm. Kaelin, um, would you please tell us where can we find you on the Internet? Sure. Um, well, my website keelanpatrickburke.com one of the longest okay. website addresses probably in the last 10 years um, <laughs> I'm on Facebook my Facebook author page is facebook.com keelan.burke or just okay. the search will turn it up as well I'm also on Twitter as Keelan Burke okay. basically you just do a, a Google search of my name will turn up everywhere I'm hiding very good um, when can we expect to see another book from Keelan Patrick Burke Next month, the last book in the Timmy Quinn series, Nemesis, a full-length novel, epic conclusion, will be, uh, it'll probably be released in about three to four weeks. And after it's released and you've got some feedback, will you come back and tell us about it, please? I absolutely will. I'd be delighted. Well, Kaelin, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and telling us about your stories and how you got started. You have a fascinating history. Congratulations on all the awards that you've won. I hope that we get to see you in, in some more movies. And, and do you plan on doing theater while you're where you are in the Midwest? No, no. I think uh, I have enough on my plate writing-wise to keep me busy for the next 50 years probably. So years no plans. So. As of no yet. plans. Do you plan? I, I know. I, at one point, I, I mistakenly said that you directed. Would you like to maybe dabble in directing? Oh yeah, I'd love it. Anything, anything, any creative pursuits where I think I could learn something for them and have a good time, then I'm probably completely up for it. Well, thank you again for joining us, Keelan. Uh, it has been a pleasure talking to you today and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about you and hopefully we'll hear, be hearing from you too thank you for coming Keelan thank you very much Pam thank you and I had a great oh, time and I've enjoyed your sense of humor too Keelan um, uh, it's subtle I think but I think if I were to sit down and have a brew with you or something you'd be a pretty funny guy oh, I yeah. would think so too <laughs> well we'll have and to I'd make that happen bar. and we'll find out you know what? It's the bar stories that would get for me, that's for sure. The bar stories, I'm sure they're good. Oh, plenty more in the pipeline. Oh, I'm sure. Cool. Thanks, Keelan. Have a great afternoon. Have a wonderful weekend. You're very welcome. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ah, that was well, very Anne. nice. Thank you, Pam. Very nice. I and, enjoyed uh, that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it sounds can. like maybe I could read Ken. It doesn't sound like it would just scare me. So I'll well, it, you know how I feel about that stuff. Even that Vincent Price stuff scares the poop out of me, so I'm not the least bit interested in Can you take poop in, on the air? I think I can. Okay. Um, well, as, as even, long as I don't say... Even, you know. I know. Even when I read um, Edgar Allan Poe when I was a kid, I wouldn't go oh. in my basement until I became like an adult. It had me so scared. So uh, I think it was Pit and the <laughs> Pendulum, which banned me from the family's basement after I read it. I was just too scared. So we'll see. <laughs> You know, because he sounds like he's so fascinating. Hey, but next week, Pam, you want to um, tell her? Yeah, her let's talk coming. about his coming up. One of my favorites, she's a hometown favorite. She's a lovely woman, incredibly talented, has 100 books to her name, and written across different genres. Heather Graham, Possessor, is coming. She is wonderful. And I understand that you bravely picked up one of her ghost stories. I'm so proud I love of you. you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and I was able to perfect. even sleep. That didn't scare me, so it was good. Yeah, I like good. her ghost See, And I read I the like romance. Her and I I I read the romance stuff, and I've read her mysteries, her murder mysteries, very good. And then you have someone special coming up on Friday the seventh. Can you tell us about Martin, please? 
Um, I can, and I can also tell you that we found another guest to go with him who I am not going to tell you about right now, but Martin has a wonderful coming of life book that has romance and suspense. It's called My Temporary Life. So um, wow. he will be there with a surprise guest with that. That's so we will be, be fun. publicizing that, yes. And, and you know, on September Black. 14, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I'll tell you what, we're getting pretty lucky with all these authors across the pond, because you know, Sean Black, my man, he's coming, and he's going to be great. I can't wait to talk to Sean. And then Pam, after you that... Pick hotties, Pam? You yeah, pick well, hotties. you know... Why not? To me, they're all hot. They're 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 brilliant people who write and publish and and have their books published. Now, I happen to have my best friend visiting with me today because we're going to our fortieth high school reunion, and her name is Rose DePaula. So say hi, Rose. Hello. So Rose and I have a favorite author, and on September twenty first, Rich Gibson is coming to talk to us. Man, that's going to be fun. And just to let our um, our listeners know, Ian Woodhead, another horror writer who really is blood and guts from the UK, is going to be with us. We have um, really interesting authors coming up uh, throughout the rest of the year, so stay tuned. And please go to our Facebook page, Authors on the Air, and like us, because we like to give away lots of books. And as a matter of fact, whoever's the last one to post there tonight, I'm going to send them Keelan, uh, Keelan Patrick Burke's book. How Which about one, that, Ken? Anne? Ken? I don't know. Would I, you know we'll see. We'll see okay. what they like, okay? Okay, well, go have fun at your 40th reunion. Cause you're hey, probably what are we doing this, this weekend? What are you doing this weekend, and what do we want our friends to do? Well, you know, I'm going to just pick up a book and go sit in a comfy chair and enjoy. And I know you're going to be at a reunion, so you have no time for reading. But anyone who's listening... Find your favorite book and just enjoy. Take a little getaway in your book. Have a wonderful Thank weekend, you. everybody. Have a wonderful and weekend. You too. Thank you for joining have us. A, have a Bye, good reunion. Smart. Have a great reunion. Thanks, Smart. Talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining Authors on the Air. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.